Everyone's telling you to set up dirty tanks and ecosystem aquariums, and everyone's showing you how to set up these systems. And it's great, everyone loves seeing someone set up a tank, and everyone's telling you the benefits, but there's a few misconceptions and stuff flying around, and the people who are teaching you how to set it up aren't necessarily telling you how to maintain it and what to expect in the long term. So I thought I'd put like a video out tying up a few of my videos and hopefully showing you how what I'm talking about applies to these principles in the long term because like I was saying about Father Fisher's fourth dimension, his whole philosophy when you look past the controversies that come because when you actually watch his videos he's asking you a question in the title he's not telling you to do something and he's explaining how it should be done a lot of the time and I know a lot of people are for and against the father fish method but I think that's an important thing that he touches on is thinking about in the long term now people look at it either high tech or low tech planted tanks don't they and with high tech there's a lot of things that we I looked at there's the likes of co2 injection getting the co2 the highlights and everyone uses tom bars well not everyone but a lot of people use tom bars estimative index where we saturate the system with nutrients and then we change them out and we monitor nutrients now with a low-tech tank you can kind of apply the same principles really instead of instead of dosing up to a level and then water changing it out we could do it the other way around and kind of try and balance our aquarium to come up to that kind of level and once we start getting out or seeing deficiencies then we know we need to adjust so we can still go long term without water changes um, we just need to understand how to balance our system and the first protocol usually is it, it's usually ramping your lights down a bit and letting because we're relying on natural processes to produce nutrients and CO2 so as far as I'm concerned if we ramp down our lamp or our light a bit that can be the starting point for getting balance in our system and then I've seen a lot of people who advocate the high-tech planted tank systems I see them say well the Wolstab method or the father fish method is inherently flawed and um, they always say you're going to see nutrient deficiency at 6 to 12 months now is that an inherent flaw with the system or is it an inherent flaw with our practice because there's the gentleman who's for, uh, George Farmer's just posted the video in the last couple of weeks or months but the guy who's got a 28 year old system and his system is basically, although it's not dirty it's running on the principles of the Wallstad method I would argue um, and I argued in my video with the, I think it was the Wallstad hack where I showed you I didn't have a soil substrate in my aquarium but I had an active substrate with a high cation exchange capacity and that gentleman's got laterite, a coarse gravel and a fine gravel. So what he's doing is he's promoting a high CEC environment where he's getting, he's probably getting a nice balance of anaerobic and aerobic conditions in that substrate. So it's breaking the nutrients that the fish and the inverts and stuff in that system and the plants, everything that's breaking down is being processed by a nutrient cycle and, and gas exchange which is a fundamental core principle of the Wallstab method and that's what I was trying to address in my video so although I don't have a soil substrate I'm applying the processes involved to generate nutrients and CO2 in my system the first thing I wanted to talk about is what I call my first key concept which is dilution is the solution like I was saying before when we set up an aquarium or we do anything like this with our ecosystem and with plants especially it takes about two weeks for the system to adjust to what we've done now I was talking the other day about applying, applying bonsai terms to or principles to our low tech ecosystem aquariums and the first one I was talking about applying was the one insult per year that bonsai practitioners do and I feel like this is something important because with our low tech systems everything you see you want in a week imagine if that's a year in terms and if we give it one insult or Diana Wallstad says every six months to do a water change so if we went in and done like maintenance like a big insult say like a big pruning or 
adjusted something massive in our system, then when we do the water change, we're resetting the balance. That's all I always talk about when you're setting it up. Like I use the other analogy of a rocket. Imagine when you first set up a wall stab method tank or a father fish or any soil dated aquarium. It's like a rocket, it's packed full of nutrients. And that's to get the rocket out of Earth's atmosphere. And once it's established into its orbit, then it jettisons everything. And it's it's running on a different type of system, isn't it? It's so that's the analogy I'm trying to portray. Everyone sees the setup as the wall stab method, but that's not. We have to get past that and get into the wall stab method. And people tend to pick the plants and stuff that will do all right in the short term, but they won't necessarily do all right in the long term in a wall stab method aquarium. And as well, the likes of epiphytes, your rhizome plants, a lot of your rhizome plants. Maybe instead of, if we thought in bonsai terms of once we've done our first year and then our first insult, we could anything that's fast growing that's starting to struggle, we could remove from the aquarium, we could cut it out. Say like stems, if there's any stem struggling, and then we could add some wood, a bit of scape, and and we could add our epiphytes, which once you pass the first year, the chances of getting algae have gone right down. So the likes of your epiphytes, which are slow growers, they they'll, uh, they'll appreciate a a maturing wall stud, but with the aggressive, as I was saying, like when it's burning all its fuel, it's not going to appreciate that. And because the leaves hang about for a while and not, they're not replenished quickly, you can get algae growth on them. It's all about addressing balance. And like I say, so you've got the first two weeks of your water, change the water out during the first two weeks and get it down to a level where the plants can get a grip because it's going to take two weeks for the plants to start adjusting to the new environment and then they'll start kicking in and then we'll start getting our ecosystem or data to the aquarium to start to balance and that's why people say run your light really low because the only thing in your system that can get a grip in the first two weeks realistically is algae because it's a simpler mechanism or it's a simpler organism to plants so we can get going faster so what we want to do is try and put it in a situation where it's struggle and try and give the plants an unfair advantage with regard to water that then so your water changing to keep the balance in the system and then once once it's kicked in i must we'll get move on to my fourth concept i talk about which is actually i think it should be the second which i always talk about the engine and the recycling plant of an ecosystem or a day to the aquarium and what the, that is is the soil the cap and the the roof feeding plants. If we look at Diana Wallstad's uh, videos, or she tends to use a lot of rosette plants. Now, there's three types of plants, isn't there? Or four. The first one's your rosette plants, which tend to be heavy roof feeders to get down there. And the processing in the, the they're making our soil healthy. And then the second type is stem plants. Now, while these are aggressive growers, and they can do well in, in the initial phases, a lot of them will struggle with the nutrient levels in an established wall stab method or ecosystem or data the aquarium unless we're unless we're making sure they've got what they require but sometimes rather than trying to adjust to accommodate something else maybe we should focus on if we're doing something to promote stuff that actually benefits being in that type of system your third type of plants is your epiphytes your rhizome plants, like your java ferns, your bucephalandras, your anubias and I feel like these would benefit from after the initial setup and maturation of a dated ecosystem I feel like these would do well after that and that's your third type of plant and then your fourth is obviously your floating plant, your aerial advantage now that no one touches on this, it helps not only does it help do the heavy lifting but once the heavy lifting's done and our tank's a little bit more established, we can use it in terms of if we've got a little bit of floating plant left and it hasn't all exhausted, then because it's right up against the light and it's using CO2, we can use that as a law of deduction, can't we? Because we know it's got enough light and enough CO2. So then if it's starting to show signs of it struggling, then we know there's a nutrient deficiency. Whereas if our submerged plants are struggling we don't know whether 
it's CO2 or nutrients, but we can not just it can't be the CO2, it can't be the nutrients if the floating plants are doing well. So it kind of helps us understand what's going on nutrient wise in our aquarium. And also with the engine, like it's important to understand the cap. Like there's a lot of people down at Wallstad says like a three mil cap at one centimeter on one centimeter of dirt. Now that dirt doesn't necessarily to have to be packed with organics and fertilizers because if you can fundamentally understand it's more about the cycling of nutrients like Father Fish talks about, where whatever goes in the system cycles like the food web, it cycles through the system. Things start the life and live the whole life cycle in the aquarium. And what we want to try and do is keep all the positive things in the cycle and remove anything negative out the cycle. Like, but we need to think in terms of a negative feedback loop as well. Because if we had, say, for argument's sake, for a metaphor, say I put shrimp in there and I was letting my fish live off the baby shrimp. Um, if all the baby shrimp were gone, with a negative feedback loop, eventually the adult shrimp in a year or two aren't going to be breeding anymore. And then there isn't going to be the next generation to take over because they've been used as a food source in our aquarium. So I feel like that's an important thing that we need to think about. Because we need to think about the longevity of our ecosystem or data the aquarium. If we're going for the ecosystem side, we seriously need to consider that. And so that's what I'm saying. If we think about it in them terms, then it's not so much important how much nutrition we put in at first. Because we can add nutrition to the aquarium via feeding our fish or other means, such as organic matter breaking down um, and feeding a fish. Can also it gives us a little trick where we can get nutrients into our system if we think there's deficiencies we can instead of a massive overall we can simply modify diets for instance we could start feeding such if, if we thought there was like uh, if we thought there was a deficiency in calcium magnesium or potassium in our system we were starting to see signs of nutrient deficiencies we can start feeding say our shrimp and snails in our system, which is our cleanup crew, which I want to touch on that because it, later on in the video it's very important. But um, if we start feeding these, then they release basically little packages of fertilizer in our system, which because of the diet is naturally packed with calcium, magnesium, potassium, and that's an important part of the ecosystem. Is we need to be getting these things in there. Like your micronutrients and your macronutrients. Now, I'm not an expert on these. All I know is the big three. You've got nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, and then you've got your micronutrients, which are calcium, magnesium, which build up, they make up your GH. And then you've got like the likes of your um, iron, uh, manganese, and the list goes on and on. Um, zinc, stuff like that, which your micronutrients are needed in a much lower level, but your macronutrients are needed in a much higher level. But they also need to be kept in check because these are the things that can fuel cyanobacteria or algae, arguably. So that's my third key concept. We need to a uh, second key concept, which it's the fourth, but it should be the second really if I think about it logically, is we need to promote that recycling plant, which will f it's the nutrients of our system. And then I talk about the engine which runs the ecosystem, it's the plants absorbing the nutrients and we need to keep all that in balance and it's our fish as well isn't it, it's the, obviously the recycling plant releases CO2 in the initial phases but also fish respiration and the food they break down, everything breaking down releases CO2 and that's another thing I, I find a lot of people talking about Wallstab methods and Father Fish method tanks and ecosystem aquariums and the running sponge filters and stuff and that's just gassing off the CO2 so you're constantly creating an imbalance in your ecosystem whereas you have low flow that's not turbulent on the top of your tank it's basically adding a cap like a, a lid it's closing off the ecosystem and it's keeping the CO2 in that, so our plants can use them and a byproduct of plants using CO2 in photosynthesis is oxygen, so symbiotic relationship between the fish and the plants with CO2 and O2 or oxygen. So that's where we, in the engine, that's where we need to be processing our ecosystem. We need to be focusing on 
nutrients and gas exchange. That's where we need to be balancing, or which is my second my second key concept, which should be maybe my third, is it's the balance of light, nutrients, and CO two, and in the engine of and in the engine of the ecosystem, that's where this plays out. It's really important, and usually we can do with our lights lowering, and then if we haven't got turbulence water, if we've got slow laminar flow or no flow at the top of the aquarium. Like I used to, I like to use a, a power head, not a wave maker, unless it's a big aquarium, but a power head or some sort of, something that'll push a laminar flow, like a straight line of flow, that doesn't create turbulence on the surface because then you're promoting the gas exchange. So with CO2, it will, if the plants are using it, and this, it's below equilibrium, CO2 will be drawn into the system. However, if there's an abundance of CO2, it'll gas out. So therefore, a wall start tank, ideally, would be shallower and wider to promote as much CO2 equilibrium into the system as possible, as opposed to running a sponge filter, which would gas off CO2. And my third key concept, which should possibly be my fourth, when I think about it logically, is it's not just plants in the system that matter, it's plant growth. Now, I've talked about plants in a ne negative and positive energy states. Now these are bonsai terms, like I said, there's a lot of bonsai terms that can be applied to plants in general. And when plants are in a negative energy state, not growing, we need to balance everything. We need to make sure they're getting enough CO2, enough light, and enough nutrients, both macro and micronutrients into them. And then they'll bounce back. And then once they get into that energy positive state, they'll say, right, well, I've got enough nutrition now. I've got enough energy stored to sustain myself. Now I'm going to put out new growth. And there's certain tricks we can do to promote this, isn't there? But that's the important thing is we need the plant growth. That drives the engine of the ecosystem in the second concept. And that's what's going to create the symbiosis between our plants and our fish and our invertebrates. Now, I was talking about our cleanup crew before, which brings me back to a good point. Um, I want to touch on my setup. I talk about different soils, and while a lot of people are pushing tons of organics and tons of nutrients in the soil, I feel that's a misconception of the Wallstab method. I think it's more important that we have something with a high cation exchange capacity, which basically in simple terms, it's like a little sponge that absorbs nutrients and it holds it there, ready for plants to absorb them nutrients when they want them. And I feel like it's more important to have that cation exchange capacity than it is to have high nutrients in the substrates because that's gonna exhaust. Um, we're gonna to have to use methods to get them out the system or we could try and cap it in the system and then I think, well, that's kind of illogical if we're capping it underneath and um, we're potentially creating this anaerobic condition. We've got all this nutrition, which is our beneficial bacteria, which in a highly oxygenated, like traditional method system, traditional filtration, it uses oxygen and ammonia to produce nitrogen. But when you remove the oxygen, it starts using the nitrogen and the system becomes anoxic, the bacteria become anoxic and people, if there's people watching this now shouting but that's good, I don't see your point or well, what's the point in having a soil substrate if it's not promoting plant growth, if it's not adding to the symbiosis of an ecosystem you may as well just put the plants in and plant in the sand because if you plant like stem plants and stuff in the sand they'll, they'll still grow and they'll still use the nutrient cycle going on in the system and as things break down the system they'll still release CO2 and that's my point there's no point having the soil there if we're not promoting if we're not maximizing its potential so therefore instead of putting all these highly nutrient rich substrates like I'd go to Bonsai and say, well, why don't we put something in that opens the structure? I've talked about Akadama. I've talked about horticultural grit. If we break it up, we get the oxygen down there. We, we promote the bacteria and plants will help oxygenate the, the soil. 
but we need to promote its efficiency, don't we? So like the likes of your loams and your topsoils, they've got like your they've got your compost sands and your clays, which one's got a binding structure. So that's got like a high cation exchange capacity that, which binds stuff. And then one's got sand gives you structure and then the compost gives you nutrition. It's as if these people who are making these soils understand what needs to be in a planted system. So there's that and then there's like people talk about moss peats or peat mosses and I feel like these are an important composition to our ecosystem substrate because they've naturally got a high CEC capacity, they naturally hold nutrition and there's discussions about the efficacy of using peat mosses and as far as I'm aware and you can correct me if I'm wrong but I use Irish stuff, the Irish moss because apparently it's it's more sustainably resourced as opposed to sphagnum moss peat, I never buy sphagnum moss peat so I feel like rather than just using compost or high nutrient stuff in the substrate I feel like if we use a balance of structure, nutrition and cation exchange capacity I think this gives a healthier environment for our plant roots and our bacteria to live in because it's all symbiotic and then our cap like a lot of people saying two inch of sand so the finest grain sand I can come across is like half a mil now Diana Wallstad saying that three mil is optimum and she's saying the maximum depth is two inches of cap and I think if we're using the smallest grain size we can at the maximum depth we're right out of our window of what's optimum and basically the argument for this is well if the soil leaches through the cap then it gets into the it gets into the water column and it causes an algae outbreak now we need to be thinking long term here that like this algae outbreak could be a short term thing if it does potentially leak but what's the best method to address this is maybe add a, a tiny little bit like a little like another mill of cap maybe you've got a thin section in your cap now I'd rather adjust it slightly and put that in create this pro big long term problem where it could all be anoxic and people will argue that oh well hydrogen sulfide and methane and stuff they're not toxic to your system and like I said but well, might not be detrimental to your system but if it's not positive to your system I don't see the point in it being there like, now the way I'd establish an ecosystem I feel is really important to talk about because people talk about it and then so you set your tank up and then that's it. In my opinion the way you should set it up is you should, ideally you mineralise your soil first and mix it up like I said like there's different mixes but they all tend to if you fundamentally understand what I'm saying and what's in the compositions of the different soils you ideally want like 50% of cation exchange capacity or 70 up to 70% high cation exchange capacity and then you want about 20% of a balanced nutrient structure and CEC substrate like a like a topsoil or a loam or something you want to get that in there with like as I say you want something with a high cation exchange capacity and you also want something that adds structure I've talked about Akadama, which has got CEC and structure, and there's stuff like lava, rock, horticultural grit, all these things add structure to the soil. And I, I know I, I've promoted a couple of different types of mixes, but when you fundamentally understand what I'm saying, they all tend to have a similar amount of nutrient, CEC capacity, and structure, just the compositions are different and how it's made up. And ideally you want to mineralise that, you want to put it outside and let it get wet and dry out and wet and dry out. And this will start burning off the high levels of ammonia in the system because we want to calm it down ideally. A lot of people set up like wall start tanks and they're trying to benefit off that first 12 months of the cycle. They're trying to benefit off the first 12 months of that maturation and then once all that high nutrients stuff burns off out the system, which inevitably it will, then system swings out of balance and those types of things don't want to live in that system anymore whereas rosette plants and epiphytes 
will appreciate that more because they grow slower and that's what I was saying if you have if you get the amount of growth in a year that you're expecting a week or a month with a high tech system you're doing well so the likes of your Amazon swords, your crypts you, the Pongiatons, Lilies, all these types of plants will love that type of system. As well as your Epiphytes, like your, your Java Mosses, um, your Java Ferns, your Boosters, Anubis. As long as it doesn't, the tank's balanced and it's giving them what they want and it's not unbalanced, they'll grow happily in that for years and years. And that's, you, and your tank will, as it matures, year one, year two, year three, year four, it'll become more and more balanced. So, like I said, that's the cap and the thing. That's what I talk about. So I'd get them in. Possibly mineralise your soil first so you get that balance. And then get the cap on. And then you leave that with the plants into cycle and you give it a couple of weeks to get going. And then... My argument is the first thing you want to put in that system is snails because you're going to get diatom blooms and you're going to get algae blooms. Like It happens in the maturation of any system, not just... See, in fish keeping we seem to think of our system as unique to every other system, but a lot of the principles of reef keeping can be applied to a planted tank, such as how the system matures. And because of the fact we've got stuff like aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration going on in the system with filtration like in a reef system we've got a deep sand bed usually and we've got or we did when I kept them and we've got live rock which inside is anaerobic so we've got anaerobic bacteria processing nutrients out the system but these are all natural processes it's as if the reef keepers have figured out how to set up a wall start salt water method which they have it's just in salt water you don't get plants do you there's no plants that live in salt water although people tell you about plants they're all algae and algae are simpler structures and they still do well and they still promote benefits to a system so regardless of what type of system is we all get diatom bloom at first and we all get that brown algae bloom actually diatom or a lot of what we're seeing if it's an immature biofilm of beneficial bacteria because as your tank matures it cycles through different types of beneficial bacteria which some of them are slower growing but they do a better job of processing nutrients so my my argument then is you like within a salt water system you want to get snails in first and like in a salt water system I was always recommended a snail for every five gallons of water and I feel like the same could be applied to an ecosystem you want a snail for every five gallons or 25 litres and then let them get in let them get established and once the tank gets a bit more matured then we can add our shrimp which is another type of cleanup crew we can have in our ecosystem and we want to get the in my opinion you want to get the cleanup crew established and processing and then look at adding fish slowly obviously we can add an initial lot of fish once the tank cycled but we need to be promoting nutrient cycling we need to have our clean up crew breaking the fish waste down and any plant waste and getting that nutrient cycling and starting to balance that system changing water as and when needed because Diana Wallstad says to do water changes every day for the first week and then start slowing the amount of water changes down and then eventually we can slow them right down and whereas we can take everything that happens in a system in a week we can stretch that out to six months with an ecosystem and that's the magic of an ecosystem everything's in balance and then once every six months we could go in prune everything do a lot of maintenance do one big insult change the water out and then rebalance your ecosystem over the next few weeks and that's that's what we need to be doing guys that's what we need to be doing we need to be doing this slowly and adding things slowly because every time you add something that's a, a, an insult to the aquarium so that's another bonsai term so and you they say one insult a year and i'm saying maybe two with an ecosystem it's something i haven't played with yet but i understand that the concepts 
combine. In Bonsai, you do your initial styling, don't you? You get your, you buy your nursery stock, or if you're lucky enough, you get to go out and collect Yamadori, which is stuff from the wild, um, which people will pay a lot of money for. But you get that, and then you do your initial styling, you set it up, and you let it have 12 months of vigorous growth. And then you revisit the tree after a year of water and fertilising, letting it grow naturally. And then you set up the secondary structure, you bring everything in and you set the tree up so it starts to live in terms of a bonsai. And that's what we could do with our ecosystems. We could set them up, give them 6-12 months, where we just let them bed in, let everything take its course and we nurture it to get it going. And then we could go in, first insult set up the secondary structure like the epiphytes the java ferns your nubius then they'll appreciate getting in once we've matured the tank a little and then you do one insult a year now with bonsai it's like a repot or heavy pruning so we could do that one insult or with our ecosystems we could go in and do like one or two big insults a year like we could add fish which you're gonna knock the balance or we could do big pruning or we could do it all all at once and then work over the next few weeks to re-establish the balance but the key message I'm saying is while everyone's talking about setting up the ecosystem and showing you videos of setting up videos set up videos of setting these systems up which are exciting no one's helping you to have success long term now, if I had the resources available that some of these larger channels have got, um, I'd like to set up like a studio or a workshop. And this isn't a hint or anything. I'm not. I'm just saying like what I'd like to do is I'd like to set up a few of these ecosystem aquariums, and I'd kind of like to do like live workshops where I talked about doing these insults and you know if we had algae issues in a system, I'd show you how I had it. I'd address that slowly over the long term or like I was saying about the insults I'd show you how to get it up and just because you've got algae or something in your system it doesn't mean it's failing it just means something needs addressing and we need to get it back in balance so I hope you enjoyed what I've tried to portray in this video I've tried to get as much of my knowledge into this video as possible and hopefully you can revisit my other videos if you've watched the others with a new perspective and listen to what I was saying in them videos because I noticed a lot of people because I'm saying things that aren't the mainstream the kind of they, they kind of contradict what everyone else is saying but I hope when I give you an outlook of my philosophy of keeping an, an ecosystem aquarium I hope it gives you I hope you think well actually this makes sense and now what he's saying in his other videos makes sense